I decided to, to try what they were doing, and, uh, you know, I got busted for it. Good spin. A double to Wan Wan, the 21-year-old Chinese breaststroker, arrived in Sydney from Beijing yesterday, armed with 13 vials of human growth hormone. Drugs in sport are now a regular feature of the news media. What are these drugs? Why are they banned? And why do they raise so many controversial issues? First, what exactly is wrong with performance enhancing drugs? The use of performance enhancing drugs is cheating. It's not only cheating yourself, it's cheating your team, your peers, your country, and it's something you need to really consider. It's funny how athletes seem to be prepared to consider taking drugs and cheating in that way, and yet would never dream of cheating in some other way. It's also a danger to their health. Most of these drugs have side effects, the majority of which are minor, but in some cases can be quite serious. Drug taking in sport goes against uh, a lot of, well, pretty much everything that sport has stood for and stands for today. The reason I'm involved in sport is because it's really a, a healthy lifestyle. It defies all that the Olympics are about. The Olympics are about participation, being there. It's supposed to be a great, friendly, drug-free, wonderful atmosphere. If you're running against girls with beards, which is what I have done, that's destroying the sport. I mean, when you stand up on the blocks, the last thing you want to be thinking about is what the person beside you has been taking. Banned performance-enhancing drugs fall into five main groups. Anabolic agents, including anabolic steroids, diuretics, narcotic analgesics, or painkillers, stimulants, and peptide hormones and analogues, that is, similar substances. The best known of these are HGH, human growth hormone, and EPO, or erythropoietin. Also banned are certain performance enhancing techniques, such as blood doping. First, let's look at anabolic steroids. There are a number of types of steroids, but the group we're concerned with in sport are the anabolic steroids. Uh, anabolic means building up. So there the steroids are particularly uh, put on muscle and muscle strength. Anabolic steroids have, have a number of harmful effects, uh, ranging from effects on your reproductive system uh, to effects on the liver and the kidney and on the heart and the vascular system. For instance, uh, anabolic steroids lead to high blood pressure, lead to high cholesterol levels, both of which are risk factors for heart disease. There are additional side effects for anabolic steroids in females. Obviously, anabolic steroids are a masculinizing agent, so they have quite disastrous effects on the female hormonal system. Uh, as well, there are additional effects in children. The use of anabolic steroids is a special concern in teenagers, where the drug actually causes bones to stop growing, and they can finish up actually shorter than they would have been otherwise. Away, got a good start, Van der Kite. Johnson knocked the first down, knocked the second down. The main sports in which anabolic steroids have been used are the more explosive type sports, such as sprinting and weightlifting. So what effects are drugs having on sport, especially on the competing athletes? Whenever someone wins with an outstanding performance, there's always, the sort of, in the back of people's minds, they're always thinking, you know, were they on those performance enhancing drugs? You know, was there something else there, giving that extra edge? It changes the standard of, of the competition by making it that bit harder for people who aren't on drugs. It's not as if it's not tough enough already. Athletes are not only just great at sport, but they're also potential role models in society. And it's very important that they realise what effect they're actually having on younger children. We think it'll only affect an elite athlete or a person who particularly will take that drug, but it's far more reaching than that because as a community, we're deterred from being involved in sport, and that's a real issue. Yeah, one of the very unfortunate side effects of the views of drugs is that you, it starts to become a stereotype, and you look at the big, hairy female must be on drugs, or the big, uh, you know, the Ben Johnson physique must be on drugs, where a, uh, a, a sort of a thinner, leaner body type can't be. Well, that's actually quite fallacious because the training effect is more fundamental in body types. Big 
Anabolic steroids are also occasionally used to help injury recovery. There's no real scientific evidence that this helps, but certainly in the case involving an AFL footballer, Justin Charles, that was the rationale behind his use of anabolic steroids. But there's still no good scientific evidence that this really helps. I was, I was desperate, I was overcome with injuries, I wanted to get back out there. I was poorly advised and it was my mistake. An injury or an illness can be a situation where people are, uh, are put in a, a difficult uh, position. A friend of mine has had a chronic uh, running injury and they actually said to me that they would be prepared to take steroids if they knew that would improve their condition and get them back running. Now, to me, I, I can't justify that because in my own mind, if I was in that situation, that would be an unfair advantage I had on another person unnaturally and, and to me that's cheating. I think it is cheating by doing that to get out of an illness because it all takes time and you still can be above what you were before by taking the drug just to get over an illness. We know so much these days about physiology and diet and psychology and all the other aspects that tie together to, um, to create a good performance. And we know sufficient to be able to work out the best recovery strategies. The elite sports person has made the commitment to not use any form of performance enhancing drug. Injury and illness are really issues that you need to factor into your training. I think that's an issue uh, that needs a lot more discussion. Obviously there's been a few instances recently uh, where that, that has occurred. I don't believe that that uh, necessarily is seeking an undue advantage. You know, there's always that risk of someone feigning injuries or... Now, I think that's where the medical people, you know, need to take a firm stance and we're, we're relying on their honesty and integrity to say, OK, this is a legitimate uh, injury and act, acting in good faith that they are prescribing drugs that are, you know, helping people get over an illness, not giving them an advantage. That's fine in theory, but the, to how to police it and how to, to make it work without it spilling into the performance enhancing areas, the, the hard part. And if, if, it, if it was totally organisationally controlled and medically controlled, I think you could mount a good case for it. Um, but at the moment, it, it's hard to do. And so I think, in a way, it's just got to be, we've got to find other ways of getting over the injuries, I think. Human growth hormone is a naturally occurring substance that was artificially uh, manufactured a number of years ago and is used occasionally or illegally in sport. The effects of human growth hormone on athletes are not really well known, but they are, it is alleged to help in a similar way to anabolic steroids in, in muscle bulk and muscle strength. The fact that it's actually a naturally occurring substance, it's very difficult to test for. So that's one of the most disheartening things, you know, is that there is a testing procedure which isn't accurate enough to catch these people. Anabolic steroids and growth hormone tend to be used by athletes in power events. In the endurance events, one of the aims is to increase the amount of oxygen you can get to your muscles and athletes have tried different ways of doing this. One is blood doping, and what's involved in blood doping is that you take out some of the blood in your system a few weeks before the event. You then have a period of time which enables the body to replenish its blood supply, and then just prior to the event, you put back into the uh, body the blood you took out some weeks previously, so you have an extra supply of uh, red blood cells which carry the oxygen to the muscles, and that improves your endurance performance. Blood doping is an illegal practice banned by, the, by all the sporting organisations. It also has some dangerous side effects. You can get allergic reactions uh, to the blood and uh, there have been some quite serious illnesses as a result of that. Blood doping was allegedly used by a lot of endurance athletes in the 1970s and 80s, but now there is a more effective way of doing that with the use of a hormone called erythropoietin or EPO which is similar to growth hormone in that it's a naturally occurring substance and currently can't be detected by drug testing. It's uh, something that's seen to be used uh, by the cyclists firstly and it's now seen to have transgressed over to 
uh, endurance sports and basically you, it allows you artificially to have more oxygen in your system so it's kind of like catching up to the Kenyans going to train at altitude without actually needing to go there. While it's an advantage with the use of EPO to increase the number of red blood cells, if the red blood cell levels get too high that can lead to blood clots which can lead to a stroke and even death and there have been a number of deaths associated with athletes using EPO. Uh, one of the stories I've heard with EPO is that uh, athletes need to wear heart rate monitors because as they're sleeping their heart rate can drop so low because that's what EPO does it it allows you to have a higher level of red blood cell count in your in your body so you can sort of pump that around and you don't need as many pumps so your heart rate drops to such a low level that it might actually stop so you know you have an alarm go off on your heart rate monitor coach comes in lifts you up wakes you up and walks you around to start your heart up again Diuretics or fluid tablets are drugs that work by producing a lot of urine and therefore reducing the amount of fluid in the body. They are used by athletes in two ways. First of all, to try and rapidly reduce weight prior to a competition. There are certain events that have weight limits, such as boxing, weightlifting, lightweight rowing. And athletes have in the past used diuretics to try and get below certain weights. This is quite a dangerous practice because not only does it deplete you of fluid, but it also depletes you of important other electrolytes. The other way they're used is to try and flush out illegal substances such as anabolic steroids from the system. Four swimmers, Luna Wang swimming here in the 400 meters freestyle, Kai Hu Jae, Zhang Yi and Wang Wei have tested positive to triamterene, a diuretic used to mask performance-enhancing drugs. Things like diuretics and masking agents actually carry the same penalty as an anabolic steroid. The major reason being is that these masking agents quite often are used to actually hide anabolic steroids. Stimulants are another group of banned substances. They vary from drugs like amphetamines, which are illegal and were previously used by athletes, to drugs like ephedrine and pseudephedrine, which are contained in most of the common cough and cold remedies. So the main problem these days with stimulants is what we call inadvertent use of these substances in your ordinary over-the-counter cough and cold medication. Narcotic analgesics are strong painkillers that can be used to, by athletes to mask the pain of injury. Therefore, they are on the banned list. Unfortunately, they're also in some very common headache tablets, as Australian breaststroke champion Samantha Riley and her coach found out when she tested positive for a banned analgesic. Samantha had um, seven days of, of, of headaches and um, I found it didn't have Panadol, but I just reached into my bag and found one tablet that was... Uh, I knew it was for a headache and I, I made probably the biggest error of my career. The only two people that I trust enough in the world to take something like this without checking it myself first would be my coach and our Australian team doctor. There is not a, enough of an awareness by uh, general practitioners out in the field and there's not enough of an awareness by you know, our swimmers and coaches, I feel, um, because they take it too lightly until they get their fingers burned. That's one of the things about education. Every time I go to the doctor, every time I go to the chemist, I have to be very aware of every item of medication that I take. The rules and regulations on drugs have been in sport for a number of years now, and especially in Australia where we've got a, a very good system set up, there's hotlines that you can call up to check out drugs, there's handbooks that you can consult. With most drugs, it's an all or nothing thing. They're either allowed or they're banned. However, there's one substance, caffeine, which we obviously can't ban completely because it's contained in so many things such as coffee, tea, chocolates and so on. All very important for the uh, athletes. But there is a restriction on the use of caffeine and a certain level in the urine beyond which the athlete is not allowed to have. And that's roughly the equivalent of uh, six to eight cups of coffee over a relatively short period of time. 
the reason why athletes might want to take caffeine is that it's also a stimulant. But like any stimulant, an overdose of caffeine has serious side effects. Class archery from Beta blockers are a group of drugs restricted in a different way from caffeine. They're only banned in certain sports. Beta blockers are used in medicine for a variety of illnesses, one of which is to reduce the amount of shake in people's hands and those suffering with different types of tremor. And that's naturally attractive to athletes in sports such as shooting and archery, where a steady hand is very important. Drug testing is now a necessary part of sport. How is it done? It's great. Hi Sue, I'm Julie, I'm from the Australian Sports Drug Agency and I have to notify you that you When we go into drug testing, uh, firstly the athlete is notified that they've been subject to a drug test. They, from that time on, their chaperone remains with the athlete until they can actually produce the sample. The athlete is entitled to attend medal ceremonies, presentations, etc. From that time onwards, they go into the drug control facility. They get a choice of beakers, uh, take a beaker, it's a sealed beaker, take it into the toilet cubicle. Minimum, as I said before, we require a minimum of 80 mils of urine. If you can do more, keep going, the more the better. They're chaperoned during this whole process. The athlete has to be naked between the knee and the midriff. There's a need for the chaperone to actually witness the sampling um, because in the past, athletes, I guess there's been um, a challenge there for them. They've been able to do things you know, like use catheters, um, insert urine into their bladders, all sorts of terrible things have been done in order to cheat the system. So as a means of actually deterring this from happening, we're actually having people witness that sampling. And I think that things have improved since we've been able to do that. Once they've been able to produce the 80 mils, they come back in to the drug control officer. Once again, they're given the opportunity to select kits. There's an A kit and a B kit. They break the seals of those kits, check that they're clean, etc. They pour their sample into the actual bottles, seal it back up using, again, security seals. From that point on, the details are collected of the athlete, as well as the medications they may have taken the last seven days. From there, all the kits are sealed, uh, sent to a lab in Sydney, which is an IOC accredited lab. The information that the lab receives doesn't contain athlete information, it only contains seal numbers and kit numbers. So you do understand. ASDA, the Australian Sports Drug Agency, carries out both event and out of competition testing. How many athletes are tested in event testing? It actually depends on the budget set aside to do testing at each event. So once the budget's decided, they'll be able to determine how many tests can actually be conducted at the event. But most of the time it is your place getters and they'll also throw in some random tests during heats or matches, etc. Out of competition or random testing is more recent than event testing. The aim of an out of competition testing program is obviously to increase the deterrence of drug testing. What used to happen prior to out of competition testing was that athletes would be more likely to actually plan how they would take drugs, so to speak, um, and they would know that a couple of months before the major event they could actually get off the juice or whatever they've taken. Um, in doing so, they basically got away with using drugs. Well, the testing program is certainly very good here in Australia and, and the random, since I've been having random tests, you know, we're all a lot more confident that that's a deterrent to people because you know, there's no warning and, and obviously people use them out of competition for specific training phases and then they can use masking drugs but pretty hard to use a masking drug if they're knocking on your door and you're not you know and you're unaware of them coming. Our, our latest results have actually shown that only one percent of all athletes tested are actually testing positive to use of substances. This is really indicating that our testing programs are working, they are acting as a deterrent and that those who, I guess, are cheating the system are being caught. As to do a wonderful job testing, you know, random athletes and, and in competition testing, but they're testing for steroids, and, which is great. But now, you know, people have moved on to human growth hormone and those sort of growth factors, which you can't test for. So, I mean, it's almost frustrating. I, I couldn't imagine you would be silly enough nowadays perhaps to take steroids. I mean, I, my belief is that human growth hormone is a lot more expensive. That being the case, you will still have people 
um, who are taking steroids, who are taking amphetamines, taking all different sorts of things. So yeah, please keep testing, but I think we just need to increase the parameters of testing. Can the pharmaceutical companies, with the government's blessing, tag all human growth hormone molecules? You know, if it's only supposed to be used for children and with, with me for medical reasons, there's no problem having it tagged. Therefore, if athletes are taking it, have a tag, see it in the urine, bang. I think, well, that'll be great, but it'll probably take sort of four or five years to get the, the red tape through to get that testing as part of the procedure. But no, no matter what we do, there's always going to be some specific uh, drugs that we can't detect. So I think you've just got to assume that you keep trying. It's no point in giving up. That's not going to solve the problem. All right, keep going. That's fine, Sue. That'll mm -hmm. be OK. All right, if I can just get you to put the lid now back on the bottle. Yeah. Nice what gives testing its real bite, of course, is the threat of penalties if you test positive. No wonder there's plenty of controversy about penalties. In athletics, I've just reduced the, the ban from four years to two years, which I'd say probably disappoints the, the, the most athletes that I talk to because four years is good because it, it really removes you from an Olympic game. So most people will only actually go to one Olympic Games in their lifetime. So to, to have that removed from them is, is a very harsh thing. I think the reason that it was cut back from four years to two years, would you believe, is because it was so significant at four years, people were prepared to take very drastic court action and it was costing the governing body so much to fight litigation and, you know, to go to, from one court to another court to a very high court. Bob Ellicott QC has been engaged by Athletics Australia to conduct an inquiry. For his part, Kappa Bianco says he's innocent and has engaged a London-based law firm to defend himself. So the costs involved became so exorbitant that they thought, oh, well, if we reduce it to two years, we'll get less people following through and, and uh, in a sense, it will cost less money in the long run. When there's so much to lose, why do some athletes still use drugs? There are enormous pressures on athletes to be successful. We as Australians are very demanding of our athletes. We want them to succeed. We expect them to succeed. They have pressure from coaches. They have pressure from officials. They have pressure from their parents. Australia are uh, fanatical about winners. They will only glorify a winner, and I suppose other countries do it as well, but you know, unless you're winning, then who cares? If you come second or third, sorry, you're yesterday's news. They're desperate. I mean, these days is you know, great prize money, great um, glory, attention. I suppose if you're really hungry, maybe you, you can go overboard. You know, television and and the media and everything that goes with something as big as the, as the Olympics can have a, a distorting effect on a, you know, basically a pretty normal human being. Pressure from yourself is probably the most intense uh, pressure that comes from in my sport and from the coaches. And um, with the uh, Australian under 20 team, there's definitely a lot of pressure because past, you know, the last team was very successful at World Championships, they came second. So there's a lot of pressure on us to do well. What about the money available to top athletes today? Is this part of the problem? I don't think you could actually say that the financial incentives are becoming harmful because for so many years athletes at a higher level have been putting in years and years of preparation with little or no reward apart from the personal satisfaction. I think perhaps there could be a better distribution of funds, for example. I mean, the Olympic medal incentive um, the, the, the scheme is all about getting medals. In sports like rowing, where there, there aren't huge rewards available, I believe those medal incentive schemes just provide the athletes with an opportunity to continue on in the sport and not compromise their lifestyle. I mean, they're already making sacrifices in terms of careers, etc. I know of people, uh, certainly from Ballarat, in the rowing program who have been forced to move to Tasmania or to the AIS to further their sports. I believe that the body that you're born with and the way you train yourself and educate yourself in sport, if that's not good enough to succeed, well, you're, really only, you're only fooling yourself. The, the people who have used those substances must, uh, in hindsight, wonder whether they could have actually done it without the use of those substances in the first place. I think education is the only way in the end. We can do a whole series of compliance and 
uh, legalistic issues about testing and so forth. And I think we've got to continue down that track. But if that's the only way we pursue it, we're not going to get the answer. Drugs and sport is exactly the same as, you know, the drugs in the rest of society, like alcohol, uh, smoking, all the recreational drugs. Uh, they're far more fundamentally an issue than drugs in sport, and I think we've got to treat the drugs in sport issue in exactly the same way. The way to approach it is for an athlete to make uh, best use of the sport sciences that are, are available now. There's so much research done into the use of the different methods of dietary advice, uh, physiological preparation, biomechanics, uh, techniques in your particular sport. I think trying to make best use of all those attributes now that, that we do have access to is the way to the top. The bottom line is people can become great, great athletes without drugs. And that's all, all you need to know, really, in the end. And the things that make a great athlete are training, good coaching, good sports medicine backup, high levels of ambition and motivation, and they're the things that ultimately create a great athlete.